this point, we looked we looked primarily at axial loading. Uh, by axial, we mean aligned with the major dimension of the uh, mechanical component we're looking at, whatever it might be. Whether it's tension or compression, uh, we've looked at both. It hasn't been uh, there hasn't been a big difference between the two for us. But the, the, the term axial does mean in line with the greatest of the dimensions. Uh, typically, we'll, we'll put the x-axis down there uh, from now on, just sort of for reference. I don't think we'll do much else than that. Uh, now we're going to look real quickly. This, uh, this is not a big chapter. There's not a whole lot going on in this one. Uh, we're going to look at torsion. This is the twisting of... Uh, a component like a drive shaft of some kind where now there's a moment applied to each end as if to put a big twist on. Uh, we'll, we, we can draw this in two ways to, to signify this. Uh, I typically will do something like this because it just is one less step to try to figure out what's going on. But we can also use the right hand rule as a way to designate uh, the effect of torsion or, or the loading of torsion or a torsional load. So if you put your fingers in the direction that that one happens to be curling and put your thumb out. So we could also do that. We wouldn't do both, but we could do one or the other. So. Uh, just like with our um, force loads, we need them to be equal and opposite, to have static equilibrium here. Uh, we'll typically do something like this. Uh, the the uh, straight vector can work a little bit better if we just have a simple side view of a picture. But even then, you, you got to put down your pen, you got to get out your right hand and give it the, the twist to figure out what's going on. It's, it's just kind of a disconnect. So I think it's easier to do uh, just what we have there. But either way, it's, uh, that's just a, a visual reference that we need to understand what's going on, particularly with the directions, because uh, we're going to be very concerned with uh, uh, multiple power take off drive shafts, places where there's multiple places that torque is being applied of some kind. Um, and so we've got to get those directions like, right, just like we had to get the directions right when we were talking about any other type of loading. So that's our general setup. Um, we're going to put a, bring a lot of little pieces together. So it's going to seem rather scattered until we get down to a certain point and we've got to, just what we need to do to keep going. But uh, until then, we're going to have to uh, you know, kind of wrestle with things a little bit as we bring all these little pieces together. So let's, uh, let's imagine some kind of imaginary cut now, right somewhere in the middle of the piece. So we'll expose that. And we've got some torsion applied to it like that. If we look at individual pieces, maybe some little DA right there, some distance row from the center. Because of the way the uh, load is being applied there, that's going to cause some kind of force, maybe we'll call it DF there on that, on that piece. This is this is a force being applied from the part we took off. Remember, these are internal forces we're looking at to see what happens to these um, elastic materials under these loads. So as we expose that face, take this piece away, this is, this is the effect of that piece on the internal face that we expose. Again, a, a, an imaginary uh, exposure of those kind of faces. And we can look at all kinds of little pieces at different rows, different distances away from the center. 
and sew on around the piece. And then, of course, we'd want to integrate over the entire face. So we'd, uh, we'd take all those little pieces. Um, we have some moment arm times some force being applied. And if we integrate over the entire face, you familiar with that symbol, integration over an area? or sometimes it's a surface area, but this will be just the cross-sectional area. And if we add all of those little pieces up, then, of course, that's the total torsion or torque being applied to this piece, if we go over the whole face. Now, this little bit itself, right here, that's the or we can replace that with the shear stress because it's the force acting over that little elemental area we've got there. So we can put that in as well. We've got rho and then tau dA. Okay, so there's our, our first little piece just to kind of set things up as we're going as we see, remember that we're looking at the inside surfaces here to see what the internal forces are. So we're going to hang on to that for a little bit. Actually, I'm going to need a little more room, so I'm just going to move it down. Here we've got the row. Okay, so we're going to hang on to that for a second. We'll come back with that. That was just sort of a preliminary setup. Now we're going to take this, this same piece, and instead of looking at an uh, internal surface uh, in cross-section, we're going to look at an internal surface down the length of the piece. So that's, that's the original outline of the piece. We're going to go to some intermediate surface and see what's going on there. So there's, there's some intermediate surface at some radius rho. Now here's another convention we're going to use from here on out as well. The outer radius, the maximum row, we're going to designate as C. So um, that could be, uh, C is defined as rho max, where rho is the radius, the, the distance from the axial direction, from the axial direction, not along the axial direction. Alright, so we've got this this exposed interior piece. Let's imagine a line scribed on that surface all the way down the axial direction. And that would actually, if we let it go through the piece, would be a, a planar surface in the axial direction from the uh, axis down the center out to this imaginary surface that we've now exposed. Arbitrary length. Yeah, uh, no, the, the length is not arbitrary. What's arbitrary is our radius from the axial direction. But the, the length is still whatever it was here. In fact, we uh, we, yeah, we will need that length, so we'll call it L. All right, as I put a little <coughs> twist to it, uh, imagine this end fixed, which would mean the torsion is applied by the, uh, the, the reaction to the, the mounting here could be... Uh, uh, causing that same torque down there. 
So as we twist this piece, then this plane is going to deform down to here somewhere, but the far end is fixed. So we're going to have a little movement something like this. So that point will go down to there as this piece twists. This big long thing got a little turn to it and we would see uh, exactly that type of thing if we actually had this line inscribed on the side there. Well, if we look at it uh, with some uh, critical eye here, we should realize that this angle is actually the shear strength. And I'll label this angle here. We'll label that phi. That means that arc length, the distance this little point moves along the outer center, this arc length here, we can then say is L gamma, and it's also rho phi, where phi is however much twist is put into the piece relative to the other end. Or the shear strain is rho over L phi. In other words, the shear strain along the piece is directly proportional to the angle of twist in the piece. Because rho and L are just some constants of geometry, length of the piece and uh, whatever radius we happen to be. It's nothing to take this a little step farther, actually not that one, the one below it is more useful because it actually gives us the shear strain. So I'll go right from here. We can then say the maximum shear strain is going to be, well, at the maximum radius, which is C. So we know now where the maximum shear strain is at the outer surface. Remember that's the that's the radius C. Oh there I got it there. So C equals rho max. If we put maximum rho in here we'll get maximum shear strain. If this piece is going to fail, it's going to fail at the outer surface. Rather than inside somewhere, it's going to start to fail due to over shear, over torquing, it'll start to develop cracks uh, in the outer surface and may or may not be that's enough for it to fail there, but uh, you can imagine you don't want that kind of thing to happen either way. All right, so there's the, the first little piece we're really getting at what kind of loads are in here. Um, I'm not real sure why, but I'll give it to you. I don't remember that this is much any great shakes here. If we put these two together, we get that the shear stress, sorry, the shear strain is rho over C times a maximum. That just says it's linear, the, the shear strain varies linearly with radius from zero to this at the center to the maximum. Uh, so we got that piece. I don't know that that's any great shakes. If you do remember though, we have the modulus of rigidity. Remember how that's defined?
Remember, uh, the, both of these modules that are, are material characteristics, both of them defined as load over response of the material. So for the elastic modulus, that was stress over strain. This was the same kind of thing, only done for shear. So the load there is the shear stress divided by the shear strength. So that we can use in here where we have the shear strain, we can then put it in and we get that the shear, the, the shear stress at any point is again linear through the material. And the shear stress is a little bit more important to us uh, in terms of the design concerns because that's the load that's being applied to the piece. What that means is if we look at the end of the, look down the shaft, and there's some radial distance row, and we graph across the piece the shear stress it's experiencing, we see that it's linear with radius, and so is zero at the center, and grows linearly to a maximum stress at the outer surface. So if we're twisting the piece, like this, we'd see this kind of shear stress that varies linearly across the piece with the maximum shear stress at the outer surface. So that would be the, the place where if it was going to fall, fail, that's where we'd expect it to fail. Uh, nice in one way is that that's easily inspected. If the worst case was somewhere interior, it uh, would be much harder to inspect that. And if we happen to have a tube rather than a solid shaft, and we graph the shear stress across the piece, we notice that, well, where we don't have any material, we're certainly not going to have any shear stress, but it's still linear across the piece but we have a minimum shear stress at the inside surface. And it varies linearly between the maximum and the minimum shear across the, uh, across the cross section throughout the piece. Good day for drawing skills. This is a good class for it. Particularly tough drawing good circles that are concentric. Right, John? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, let's take it a step farther. Remember, we're trying to pull a bunch of little stuff together to make bigger ideas that we can use more readily. We just had this, this integral over the surface that gives us the uh, uh, total torque, but now we can bring this piece into it because we've got the stress, the shear stress right there, so we put that piece in and we get rho times rho over C tau max dA. That's just bringing the uh, part we just set up down into there. And it's an integral. We can pull out the constants, which are C and the max.
maximum stress. So we can pull out those two pieces. We get the integral of rho squared dA. Which, let me just bring it up here. Oops, got the constants pulled out. Good. Tell maximum, that depends upon the radius of the piece and whatever the loading is. So uh, we're not looking at dynamic loads, we're looking at static loads, so that doesn't change. And then we have this rho squared dA in there. Notice this rho squared dA is entirely dependent upon the cross-sectional geometry, whatever the shape is and whatever the size is. This is what we call the polar moment of inertia. sections, it's half pi c squared, which happens to be uh, i x plus i y, where those are the moments of inertia that we remember from before with, uh, with this kind of geom this kind of coordinate. If, uh, uh, X is there, and Y is there, and Z comes down the piece at us, then this is essentially the moment of inertia about the Z axis. These are the moments of inertia about the X and Y axis. And those two would sum to give you the polar moment of inertia. Uh, we're not going to use that. We're not going to use this part. This part, of course, is going to be very useful. And for a tube, so what would we call this? Uh, that's for a solid shaft. For a tubular shaft, which is if you, uh, next time you drive your, uh, your drivetrain out of the bottom of your car, actually it won't happen much anymore since rear wheel <coughs> cars are very rare, but if you ever look at a, a, the side view of a delivery truck, you know, just something uh, taking uh, produce and the like, you'll see the shaft running there to the rear wheels. That's a tube. And if uh, it breaks open and, and uh, you, you can grab it, run out there and get it from the guy before he puts it back in and you can, you can check this to see it's a tube. And its polar moment of inertia is essentially the difference between the inner and the outer, where C1 and C2 are the outer and inner radii, uh, respectively. So now we can uh, now say that the torque actually be the maximum torque if we have the maximum shear stress in there at the maximum radius. We can now calculate directly, and that maximum uh, shear stress is uh, a material property. The, the, just like the normal shear stress, yield stresses and the like would come from the manufacturer, so would this type of number. So just to put a couple uh, numbers to it, we'll do a quick calculation. Imagine some kind of 
two with some kind of torque applied to it. The equal and opposite reaction at the wall would be in the other direction around the back. So we'll say that's 1.5 meters in length. And the inside and outside diameters are 40 and 60. ID means inner diameter, OD means outer diameter. And a typical shear, maximum shear stress for steel is about 120 megapascals. So we'll put that down. Actually, the typical maximum is greater than that, so we'll say this is the design criteria. So we need to what the maximum torque then can, that this material can uh, can withstand. Got all the little pieces there. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. give you a little gift. I think I have a little gift here. Yeah, I do. Uh, for, uh, actually, I, well, no, I won't bother since this is a tube. I have a little gift that's from a solid shaft. I'll give you in a little bit. Just to show you I'm a nice guy. All right, so calculate then the polar moment of inertia for this. Then we've got the other pieces that we need to put in it. We can just calculate that. And you can also put it together with your uh, correct units. And so you give me that in kilonewton meters. Okay, just to put some numbers here, get used to these things, you need to calculate J for this. The polar moment of inertia for this particular tube and cross section. C, C is the maximum radius where the maximum shear stress is going to be experienced. And for design purposes, uh, we're just saying this one, we want to keep that at 120 or below. Because there's the outside diameter, so the outside radius is half that. The 30. Monday morning? I think you're not going to kick in for like 15, 20 minutes at least. At least. Maybe if Charles is bringing coffee for everybody. So you guys are welcome to set up that coffee pot in the <coughs> lab if you keep it clean and pay for it. No, it's, it's a, a torque, so it has units of moment arm times force, so kilonewton kilometer meters. All right, so double check your units, see what you get with it. Double check that, Travis. J for a tube, one half pi C1 to the fourth minus C2 to the fourth. That's yeah, 
So that's going to have meters to the fourth. There's meters squared under here. You can get meters under there. You'll be left with just meters on the top once you straighten out all the units. So the polar moments of inertia can be real big numbers. They can be real small numbers, depending upon just what units you're in. I think I have it here. Yep. Is the polar moment for, Wait a second. for solids? Oh, wait. Sorry? For solids, then, is it, is it C to the fourth or C squared? C to the fourth. Did I write down squared? You wrote down squared. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, catch that then. Um, just so you're used to writing pi r squared, I, I think that's what I was going. But yeah, the, the polar moment of inertia for either of these, of course, have the same units. So, is everybody here? Some are going to have to watch the video, so I hope they see it. So make sure you get your unit conversions right. If this is in millimeters to the fourth, you need to have the unit conversion from meters to millimeters, and that itself has to also be to the fourth to get the units to work. Still not what I got. Not that that has uh, proven anything in the past. Yeah, that's supposed to be C to the fourth, sorry. Both of them are C to the fourth. This one just happened. This is nothing more than the polar, the inner polar moment of inertia subtracted from the outer. If you have the right exponents on. Got something? Okay, that's more like what I had. We're not agreeing. Not there yet. What do you have? It's T. That's. I can't see. No, that's not what I had either. All right. That's better. Make sure the unit conversion's right. What do you have for moment polar polar moment of inertia? You have that, David? With units. Um, hold on. Um. Travis? Oh, you got it? No, they can try someone else. Okay. <coughs> Samantha, you have it? The polar moment of inertia for this? Yeah. What units? So you got to take your megapascals, remember that's newtons per square meter, and then the 30 millimeters on the bottom. And that's all the pieces. And you should get 4.08 kilonewton meters. Right. Travis, trouble with that one first? Yeah. Yeah, the easiest one. Using diameter and centimeters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Be be real careful about these. Uh, it is very typical. Diameters are what are given in in uh, dimension drawings and the like. But the polar moment of inertia. Uh, if you want, you're welcome to put d over two in there and then carry out the constants and get the get the slightly different equation. All right. What? Uh, that's the. Uh, maximum, what's the minimum shear stress in this situation? <coughs> and why are we concerned with the two?
What's the minimum shear stress expected in this piece? Minimum shear stress. Now, look at those aren't units for shear stress. So, you calculated something else. Remember, this comes from the fact that the shear stress is linearly distributed. on that inner surface. It could be that for whatever reasons there might need to be some coating there or cladding of some kind and so you're worried maybe not about failure in the material but failure in perhaps some adhesive or some bonding characteristics between the two materials. So if it varies linearly It'll just be then uh, C2 over C1 times time max. That's just the tau over C and the Torque for the piece is the same. <clears throat> that does not vary across the cross section. That's the load. And then the J is also for the cross section. So that should come out to something like, I think, 80 megapascals. Not where you'd expect the material itself to fail, but there might be something, some kind of coating or gladden or uh, inner material to which it's bonded that we need to concern ourselves with. Okay. All set? All right, another problem, but we're going to take another step with this one that is uh, very interesting in its result. So we have some kind of shaft, eight feet in length, solid shaft with a radius of 2.24 inches. The allowable shear stress is 12 KSI. You find the maximum torque, the maximum torsion, or the maximum moment, any of those words, that can be applied to this piece. Not greatly different than what we just did. You're just given something different than what you had before. Some of the numbers have changed. And give it, if you would, in Tip inches. 
<clears throat> so we can all get down to the same same place and compare our numbers easily. A pinch. All right, so same kind of thing. It's just now we're given a maximum shear stress. Need to find J and see. Oh, here's here's the little gift I'll give you for solid shafts. For solid shafts, C over J reduces to eight over pi B cubed. How useful is that? Any other professor ever give you something that cool? symbol for um, eight. Alright, you're going to have uh, C or J right there, so that can maybe speed things up a little bit for you, maybe not. Uh, we're going to do a problem where we want to find the diameter. Uh, for some reason, it's more common that these things are in diameters when designed, but the, the formulas have the radius in them. It's just screwed up a little bit, I think. This is what they do at <coughs> conferences. Figure out new ways to screw the students up. All right, in kip inches, so watch your units. <coughs> unit conversions. We got to be pretty careful with these things. So we're looking for the maximum. We can just use the equation as put. Using the allowable stress in this case. And since we're looking for the maximums, we are at the outer radius. So you see. So the equations are simple. I think the unit conversions, as much as anything, you need to watch carefully. Lots of uh, squares, cubes, quartals, whatever they're called. What? Is that real? Is what word? A quartal? I don't make up words. Yes, you do. <laughs> There's a word for everything, and I use I use them correctly. They've got something. Check with Travis. No, not usually. Check with Chris. You guys are usually yeah, pre finished yeah, first. Results. Sure, it's right without any units on it. You can always make up your own units. Not like mine, I don't make stuff up. Let's see what J is. <clears throat> or did I do J over C? No, I did J. 39.5. Inches to the fourth. So we have kips per square inch, we have inches there. So we're still okay with units. And then, well, we just have C. And that 
will then give us kip inches directly. We don't even have to do any unit conversions on this one, I don't think. But we're still not agreeing on numbers. Huh. Let me make sure I didn't write something down wrong. Yeah. Those 12 PSI, 2.24. Allowable, yeah. That's the only stuff in there. What do you have? shear stress and that will be of concern at the outer surface so we have a maximum yeah. radius in there. You still agree or did they talk out of it? What's there to be different? If you use what? Did you check then to make sure this is right? Was your A based off of the length? Huh? Was your A on there based off of the length? This? Yeah. No, this this is this is just simply C over J. C is one half pi C to the fourth. Uh, no, that's J over C. So we get uh, one over one half. Yeah, that's C over J. 1 over 1 half pi C cubed. Yep. And so we flip all that over. That's 2. And C is D over 2. Oh, okay. So you cube that, get an 8. We get, maybe that should be 16, yeah, not 8. Because we already have that one half in there. Over pi d cubed. Yeah, I think it's 16 and not 8. Would that be the, yeah. that be the difference? Okay. I didn't realize that d was. Well, there. I said it was a gift. I didn't say it was a good one. 16. Now it's 211 kip inches. All right. Uh, good engineering advice there, never trust the doddering old fools in the office. Same thing, shaft, design another shaft with the same weight and material as that one. Only it's a tube with an outer diameter of six inches. designing the drive shaft for something. There's your first design over there. Redo it, same weight, only now with the tube of not that much greater diameter. This is 2.24 radius, so this is three inches in radius. Not that much bigger. And redo it. So same allowable stress, find the maximum shear, uh, maximum torsion allowable for that design. Same weight, same. 
chain length, all that's changing is uh, going from a solid shaft to a tube, tubular shaft, and you want the same weight. Same material. the cross section is going to change, so J is going to change, C is going to change, that uh, 16 pi over D cubed is not going to apply, that was for a solid shaft. larger in diameter, depending on what the application is, that might be more than sufficient. The weight's going to be the same, so that's not a concern. the same weight, what does that then mean is also the same? Cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area. If they're the same length, then that doesn't apply. So if uh, they're the same weight, same material, the density's got to be the same. It all comes down to just the cross-sectional area. So uh, area, I don't know, we could call this example one, this example two. So all we need is that A1 equals A2. You're given the outside radius, that'll allow you to find the inside radius. Pi over C squared, where we've got C <coughs> over there, has got to equal pi over, or times C1 uh, squared minus C2 squared. And C1, you were given. So you have to find C2, then you have to find J from that. Inches, so that just changes the decimal place, not the unit, but the digits. I, so I don't have those digits. You divide by 1,000. Yeah, but that's still a more. Okay. So that's still not what I got. Okay. I don't even know what the problem is. What? Maximum radius is wrong. Um, use the same one for the previous problem. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. You've got to go to this maximum radius. This is now. Uh, C max or C1, I guess we called it. That's actually two times C1. It's down diameter. Nothing yet? Inner 
radius? No. Caught something. Chris caught something that was. All right. What are you getting for the inner radius? Nothing yet. Yes. Conveniently comes out to be two, almost. That's part of why the 2.24 was kind of an odd number to start with. Because I started this problem from a three inch, two inch tube. Okay, that looks more like it. C is the radius from there. This just says that the cross-sectional areas must be the same. That gives them the same weight. If they have the same density and same length, all we then care about, care about is the cross-sectional area. So this is the one over there, the C. And you're given C1, or you're given OD. <clears throat> you can find C2, and it should be two inches. You got that, David, two inches? Where am I looking? So where's, where's, well, what we're looking for is the maximum torque. The maximum torque that can be applied. So you should get C is, the inner radius is 2. <coughs> Do I have J? J, I think, is 102 inches of the force. Sound about right. And then you can find then the maximum torque. Now it's just the same as here, except the numbers have changed. Keep the same allowable stress. We already know if uh, we have J in inches to the fourth. And then the maximum radius where the maximum stress occurs is three inches. Shouldn't come up with a negative number. You're on the wrong side, you gotta go the other way. Good thing radius can do that. <coughs> What'd you get? <coughs> okay. Yeah, now look at that number. That's interesting. Most of us are there then, finally, or real close to it. And you get a maximum applied torque that will take us right up to the allowable shear stress. Now, maybe there's a factor of safety built in there already or not. We don't know. We're not uh, that deep into the problem. And the maximum you have is 408. And that's kip inches. Is that right? Same weight shaft, only a little bit thicker, and we almost double the allowable torque using a tube instead of a solid shaft. I think that's interesting. That's why it's much more common to see tube. What we could also do then is say, well, let's use a much lighter tube. If this is sufficient, let's go down to this with a lot less material. We could reduce the radius. We could uh, uh, keep the radius the same, re re increase the inner radius, whatever it might take. We could lighten the shaft and really reduce that 
at uh, <coughs> the, the weight. If this is a car and you can do this kind of stuff, or a truck for a long haul, this kind of stuff adds up. Now, what I think is also interesting is if you take this even farther, if you keep increasing the radius just to see what happens, so what did I, I call that C1, so if you keep increasing C1, what happens to the maximum allowable load? It's almost linear, in fact it's one of those graphs where you got to hold a straight line up to it to see it just barely is concave downwards, almost imperceptible on the screen unless you go up to really high <coughs> outer radii, which mathematically you can do. I took this up just for fun to a 25 inch outer radius, same weight, but the inside radius was something like 24.9 inches, meaning the tube now had a thickness of about a tenth of an inch for a drive shaft. What this doesn't take into account is failures in other ways. Then you have, you have a shaft that's essentially the thickness of a piece of paper, a piece of cardboard, and it's, there's a whole lot of other modes of failure than just shear stress. That's just going to buckle and warp and wrinkle and all kinds of things, but it may not fail in shear, which was the concern. So mathematically, you can take this way up, but you get such an absurd number that other things can become of concern. So be careful of what you can do with things mathematically that become uh, realistically impossible, even if the, the uh, particular mathematics in the paper say it's okay. So be careful with that. Uh, I remember when I was first working for General Electric, I was running codes that would calculate coolant rates and I let the computer code run where it wasn't really applicable anymore and I was essentially pumping ice, solid ice, through the, the reactor core. I thought it was brilliant. Well, I mean, it was very cool. It was when I looked at the temperatures and realized that my coolant had frozen, but of course the computer code doesn't know that. So it just keeps happily running along. I thought it was on to something. Well, I don't work there anymore. You put two and two together. All right, so let's, uh, let's take it a little bit of a step farther. Uh, imagine we do have some kind of drive shaft. couple places, we have uh, maybe uh, a couple gears on there. I told you there's a good class for sketching. So in a couple places we've got some gears on here. Do what you can with it. If you'd rather, we can just draw it this way and then put our, our torques applied to it so we have a couple directional torques being applied here. That way and that one. Same way on this one. Some drive shaft, maybe there's some generators or other power takeoffs put on it. You can do the drawing however you want.
whichever one of those works for you. Neither one's that easy to do. As long as you get the picture. Thing is, on this one, this particular one, we have two different shafts put together. We have a solid shaft on the outside and then a tube on the inside. And those last two are going the opposite direction. Yeah. So. Three are in one direction, one's in the opposite direction. It's a drive shaft of some kind. All right, put some numbers to it. Distance between those two is 0.9 meters. Distance between these is 0.7. And distance between these is 0.5. Now that's going to be more of concern to us now, or uh, in a bit, when we start actually looking at the deformation, like we did with the axial loading, we looked at what the loads were first, then we looked at the response of the material to that in terms of the deformation and deflection. We'll do the same thing with this. What we'll look at next is just how much twist gets put into these pieces. Uh, if that starts happening, then gears don't line up. All kinds of trouble starts with that. So uh, we'll call this one gear A, so it's got a torque of six kilonewton meters. The next one is B, C, and then D, and they are 14, 26, and 6. 14, 26, and 6, and of course those are all kilonewton meters. little bit the tube itself is 120 millimeters OD 90 millimeters ID outside and inside diameter and last little piece an allowable stress For the two solid sections, an allowable stress of 65 megapascals. We want to find then the appropriate diameter for these two solid sections. D in the two solid sections, and then also tell the maximum normal stress, uh, sorry, normal shear for each. exert no load of their own, uh, just to hold the thing. All right, for the solid sections, then we have a given limit on the shear stress. From that, if we know what the load is on those sections, we can determine a design recommend diameter and then we can also figure out then the maximum shear stress. Actually the maximum for the solid section is already given so what we really need then is the maximum for the tube section. 
because you're going to design to the allowable shear stress anyway, so that by definition that will be the maximum. So we need the amount of torsion felt by each of the sections. So, for example, if we, well, what I'll do is draw the whole piece up there. do what we've done before, put an imaginary cut somewhere, and determine what the internal torsion must be, that's what we use in the calculation. So, for example, this little end piece, we know at one end there's six kilonewtons, kilonewton meters. We know we must statically uh, balance these things. So internally, between A and B, we know there must be six kilonewton meters. So you can use that to find D. already given for the center section, so you can determine the maximum shear stress in that one as well. I put an imaginary cut in the other sections and balancing the torsional loads on each. Figure out what the internal torsion is in the material that we designed for. Remember you put these imaginary cuts wherever either the cross-sectional area changes or the load changes. When either changes, then the internal loads change.
D. No, C. This? Uh, well, you're, you're given what it is in the solid section, the two outer sections. Then you also need to find out what it would be for the inner section. just for the outer section only, outer two sections, for the solid shaft only. Why do you need this? Because if you don't know what the D is, you can't find out, uh, given the load, and they allow the allowable Stress, you need to find then the geometry that can withstand that. Essentially, you're designing the cross-sectional area, knowing the load on the, those two sections and the allowable stress. shear stress cannot exceed that and the shear stress is caused by whatever the torsion is in the section and that's what we have here now that's the internal moment times C over J screwed up. So it was what T over pi D cubed. I think that's upside down. Did I give you C over J or J over C? C over J. Yeah. So that was okay. Yeah. Because it'll have D on the bottom. Sixteen over five. Yeah. So if you put that in then uh, it's just a little easier to solve for D there, but remember that's for a solid shaft only. And so the T matters now. Saying it's the six Check your five units. What? Six five. Yeah. So you can solve then for T. Put in that uh, that C over J 
you know, J over C here. So that's the 60, 65 megapascals. D, you're looking for, actually, yeah, either one of these is work. You still have to solve for D either way. And T is uh, the internal 6 kilonewton meters. G over C, there's C over J. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So if that clock's wrong, but you guys are having so much fun. All right, this should give you, and I saw a couple of you had it, so I'll just give you the first part. You can double check the second parts. Uh, 77, 8 millimeters. 78 millimeter, then you decide um, is there common bar stock that we'd use and go to 80 millimeters, would that work? You know, we don't have to have anything custom made. Those are the next kind of design decisions. Turns out this section has the same load, so D is going to be the same for this section, and you can find a maximum of 86.2 in the tubular section there. Any uh, 86.2. Okay, so double check those. If you don't get those, we'll reconfirm them on uh, Wednesday. No, Friday.